Good afternoon, everyone. Um, welcome back to the AFPI Economics Research Conference, focusing on environmentally sustainable farming, policies, pathways, and people. And to session three, where we will be focusing on behavior change, challenging mindsets, or accentuating the positive. Um, we will be joined by three great speakers who will take us through important pieces of work on behavior and attitudes. Um, we'll have our invited speaker, Professor Moira Dean from Queen's University Belfast, Dr. Simone Angeloni from AFBE, and Dr. Catherine Glass from AFBE. Um, as we proceed through the presentations, I would encourage you to ask questions to the Q&A function and select all panelists. And first of all, to introduce our first um, speaker, our invited speaker, Professor Moira Dean, who is a chair in Consumer Psychology and Food Security at Queen's University Belfast. Um, Moira has carried out research into consumer food choice, food safety, food fraud, risk perceptions, and food supply chain management with different stakeholders. She has worked on a number of projects funded by the Food Standards Agency, Safe Food, the Danish Agency for Science and Technology and Innovation, the Medical Research Council, um, Economic and Social Research Council, the European Union and Industry. She is experienced in qualitative and quantitative methodologies for the assessment of attitudes, values, perceptions and barriers associated with food, health and sustainable living. We'll hand you over to Professor Dean. Thank you. Thank you for my invitation and, and thank you for my introduction. Um, okay, so um, I'm going to present today some of the work that we have, I have done with colleagues on the use of antimicrobials in agriculture on the island of Ireland. And we look at it from a stakeholder perspective, so we are looking at knowledge, attitudes and behaviour. I don't have to tell you the importance of antimicrobial um, the use as also the antimicrobial resistance and the problem that it's causing. Um, because of the use of antimicrobials in agriculture, there has been now some new regulations coming up in January 2022, in January about prohibiting the prophylactic use of antimicrobials. So most of the use that has been happening on the farm level means that the behavior has to change. So if you've been doing something regularly for a particular reason and you want to change it, then you need to understand what your behavior is about and you need to make those changes. So understanding people's behavior of why they did something and also how they are going to change it, what needs to be there to help them make the change is an important aspect. And that's what we wanted to study. And the key stakeholders that we selected to do that study are farmers and vets. So we wanted to identify the factors that influence their decision making, um, understand their current antimicrobial use behavior on the island of Ireland. Um, to do this, we kind of um, we didn't want to reinvent the wheel, so we said let's look to see what is ha what is known already, what is currently happening, and what is known. Based on that then we will get some inf more information with farmers and vets. So we designed a, st like a study with three objectives. First is to do a critical review of the current literature, then to do a survey with farmers and interviews with vets. But we did not want to just come up with um, questions and, um, from nowhere, but we thought it would be good to have a theory base so that we understand what the theory says about behavior change. If you apply it to this sector, then we can come up with in, in, um, suggestions of how to move forward in terms of interventions based on the theory. So what did we do? Um, you would know how to do a systematic review or a critical review. We looked at four different databases, Scopus, Web of Science, PsychInfo, Medline, using different words, combinations, and searched. Um, and we ended up with about over 1,000 papers. Through um, looking through the papers, reading the abstract, cleaning out, doing qualitative assessment, we finally ended up with the study which had 103 papers, which we did the critical review on. Just to give you a little a bit of data on the 
type of papers that are out there. We found that before 2016, there were very few papers published. But since then, there have been a lot of papers published in this area. Remember, we're not just talking about antimicrobial use. We're talking about consumers, oh, sorry, um, stakeholder perceptions, understanding in relation to farmers and vets. Okay. In terms of um, area, we found quite a lot of the work relate to European, um, but there is some work also undertaken in Asia and other countries and other continents. Most of the work, about 60 odd percent of it, was conducted with farmers. Um, there are some mixed, about 15, 16 percent with mixed, and then the rest with vet, uh, vets. In terms of sector, dairy seemed to be the most prominent one, or mixed sectors, um, and the least amount of papers were in, in sheep. In terms of methods, there were about 60% were all uh, quantitative, which means like surveys, numbers, and there are some, um, about 30% qualitative um, exploring in depth, and then there are some mixed studies. So what I'm going to present to you is if you remember those 103 papers that we did, got, we looked at all the results from there. What we do is something like coding, going through the papers and picking out all the relevant information, cleaning it off, up, putting it all together, coming up with underlying themes that addresses those um, results. And that's what I'm going to present to you. First, farmers and then um, vets. So, in terms of farmers, um, most of the papers, if you like, in there, they talked about the awareness of farmers. Um, and what we found was that most European farmers um, seems to be aware that there was, you know, they're about the purpose management and risk surrounding antimicrobial use. However, there was some confusion. But when you go on to look at um, middle and low income countries, then that seems to be problematic in that area. Um, when you look at the next one, which is uh, uh, what we call best, best practice, um, we found that, sorry, my things doesn't seem to move fast enough for me to read, so I'm going to look at my paper here. So in terms of best practice, most farmers identified that employing good farm management practices would reduce antimicrobial use. In European countries, in particular, farmers were interested in reducing them, but they identified some barriers such as financial constraints, inability to invest in farm structures uh, to improve biosecurity and so on. We um, call the next theme emotions, but it can also be called identity if you are inclined that way. So what is it about um, uh, emotions? Farm, when you do farming, it's not just a job. The, the farmers also identified um, emotionally with the animals and as being a caretaker of those. They also talked about being a good farmer. It was important to them that they were perceived by them and their colleagues as being a good farmer. But what it is to be a good farmer was tied to the type of... Um, practices that were considered and socially acceptable. So if using um, um, anti, you know, um, um, antimicro you know, antimicrobial use a certain level was seen as good practice, then the farmers were keen to do that because for them it was important that they were perceived as being good farmers. But most of them saw themselves as prudent users, and um, they were aware of the regulation and recommendations, but it didn't always kind of correspond to the compliance. Um, next one is risk. They talked about who were, I suppose, were responsible for most use. Most farmers saw medical, medicine, doctors as the people who are using um, um, antimicrobials too much, if you like, and they kind of didn't see themselves as being the problem that was, um, you know, in, in terms of use. Also, then if you talk to a beef farmer, he would say, well, it's not us, it's the pig farmers. And if you talk to the pig farmers, they would say, no, it's not us, it's the chicken farmers. So there was a kind of um, blame game going on as well in terms of who was actually uh, was to um, blame for this kind of use and who was overusing or misusing it. Um, the next one was habitual. 
So what is it is, it's just like eating. We are kind of trained to do so, you know, eat certain foods at certain times when we are growing up, and that becomes a habit, and that becomes an unconscious process. And it was the same in terms of the farm. So people, uh, with the farmers, because they were doing, um, looking after their, um, uh, their animals and treating the animals when they thought the animals were sick in a certain way, that became a habit and that is what they would kind of carry on doing. And there was, they didn't see any reason why they should change it because it has worked in the past, it seems to be doing okay, why would you want to change that kind of practice? So it was a habitual thing that seemed to carry on. Um, the next one we called influence. And who did, who did they uh, in, uh, get influenced by? So vets were, conceived, um, were seen by most of the farmers as being trustworthy information sources regarding antimicrobial use. They also valued the personal experience of other farmers. Um, and you know, so it's, uh, the peer influence was also strong. Um, a vast majority of the farmers were actively trying to reduce AMU, but small percentage of the farmers felt that they didn't have the skill and the knowledge to be able to do that, especially it was country dependent and, you know, um, if they didn't have access to the vets to be able to do that. So next, what about vets? When we, um, the papers that were published in relation to vets, we identified some themes, eight teams, if you like, and first they talked about is a moral obligation. The vets felt that they had a moral obligation to tend and treat the animal if they were suffering, to alleviate the symptoms, even if they thought that the disease occurred because and could have been avoided by uh, improved farming practices. They also said that the role of what they were there for has shifted. That one time, historically, they were there to treat the sick animals, but more and more they have become, um, as part of the farm advisory system, if you like, to improve farming management practices um, and also to sort of give advice so that the structures are there to prevent the occurrence of disease, to encourage good practices. But they, uh, they were aware that prim primarily it was the farmer's responsibility to ensure good practice, but even if the farmer didn't, they feel they had the moral obligation to treat the animal. Finance was um, talked about in, in, in different ways, but one of the things that were discussed um, in the papers was that the um, vast majority of private veterinary practices um, were seen as making profit by um, prescribed but through the prescription process. That it was thought that some farmers believed that prescribing um, by vets would be to generate venue, reven sorry, um, revenue. Um, but this didn't seem so much in the European countries where farmers and vets didn't talk, you know, identify this as an important factor. But they were aware that some farmers may not have the financial means to improve structures. Therefore, again, they went back to saying that they needed, the, they had the moral obligation to having to treat them. Plant pressure was one thing that was also identified. So they felt that the relationship between the farmers and vet was quite complex, um, and that vets sometimes felt pressure to prescribe because if the client asked and you said no or you, you, know, you suggested an, an alternative, then they would go to another vet and so they felt that, that there was a pressure from the farmer to them and therefore they um, felt they sometimes had to oblige. Um, the experience um, the vets had made a difference. So if they were a young vet, and they went into a practice, they sometimes felt pressurized by the older partners to follow whatever they have been doing, even though sometimes they felt that through their education um, lately that they would have done a different way. So depending on their experience, um, they kind of felt more or less pressure from um, clients, which is the farmers, as well as fellow vets. But as their experience grew, they were more able to say, um, you know, um, suggest alternative ways than they would have done when they were joining the practice, if you like. Um, 
susceptibility sensitivity tests they felt should be completed on livestock before administering antimicrobial on the farm. But majority of the vets believe that the sensitivity test is beneficial. However, despite this evidence, um, they found that tests were rarely completed. They highlighted various reasons. One, it was costly, but also maybe sometimes the time it took for the results to come back was a problem. So they felt that they had administered AM uh, for illnesses even when they were unsure because of the fear of being blamed for continuing illness or potential loss of stock. And they didn't want to have a reputational damage because of it. Um, they talked about their peer experiences, own and peer experiences of prominent source for their influence. Um, they also read scientific publications, conferences, um, and the different regulations um, to, you know, to um, keep them abreast about what was happening. Um, that regulations sometimes they felt would be punished, you know, seen as punishment, and therefore that should be financial consequences may result in a recoil or backlash from the farmers uh, if the farmers don't feel supported. So they felt that the regulation should have incentives uh, or rewards so that it you know, gives the, um, the farmer to make the changes um, required. And finally, they said clinical aspect was only one aspect that they, you know one aspect of prescribing they felt various other non-clinical aspects such as um, the cost withdrawal period previous experiences based on the farm the client's preference availability of the aim within the policy animals temperature uh, farmer compliance uh, with prescribed treatment all were considered uh, in their decision making before they kind of came to a conclusion Okay, so I've sort of rattled through all these things. They have been, this have been the uh, findings have been published. The one that is out there at the moment relates to um, uh, dairy, the first paper in the Journal of Dairy Science. But the other one, which is about all the farming sector, is nearly ready. It's going to come out soon. So um, you can read about it in much more detail. So what did we do next? So I wanted to tell you a little bit about the combi model. What does it mean and how did we employed it? So combi model, um, now this is where the pronunciation comes, either Miki or Michi. Um, so you would have heard about her and you would have seen her on television. It's about human behavior and um, how to change human behavior or what are the predictors of human behavior. She is part of the SAGE, been advising the government on vaccination and also um, slightly critical of what the government has been doing as well. So she's a quite well-spoken um, critique, and, but also um, a behavior change scientist who is talking about behavior change. So this model is not about the agricultural side, it's just about a human behavior change model. And what, they, what it actually says is the uh, behavior, um, the antecedents of behavior, if you like, you know, whether somebody engages in a particular behavior or not, are, it can have three, three influences, three things that kind of, you know, comes into play. One is capacity, sorry, capability. The second one is motivation. And the third one is opportunity. It's not, no, nothing is superior to other, but all three, if you like, play together for you to motivate behavior. So we wanted to use this model, it's a psychological model. We wanted to use that in relation to the agricultural uh, work that we were doing with the farmers and vets to see whether it will help us understand current behavior and could we also make some predictions about interventions that need to be done for future behavior. So what does capability mean? It's the individual psychological and physical capacity to engage in behavior. Um, motivation is defined by all the brain processes that energize the behavior, including reflective motivation, conscious decision-making, as well as automatic motivation. Um, this is unconscious, that is habit, and so on. Opportunity is defined by all the factors that is outside the individual that helps the behavior uh, possible. Okay. So in, we use that model and we, um, to um, help us design the farmer survey. So we looked at 
farmers from the beef, dairy, sheep, and pig industry. A sample of roughly 400 people were recruited. Um, the main problem here was it was during the pandemic, so our normal data collection method of maybe going to some of the um, you know places and getting people to fill in the questionnaire didn't work out. So we had to be a little bit more creative. So we used online, telephone, postal, any which way we could get the farmers to fill in the questionnaire, we did. Um, it was incentivized, so you know, if they filled it in, they, would, they could get some money. Um, some people did, other people didn't bother, and then we used um, SPSS to do the analysis. So who were the participants? Majority of them, if you like, were um, male, so 88% were male farmers. 12% uh, female. Um, majority, 50, more than 50% were between the age group of 40 to 60. Um, and also they came from the dairy sector. Um, so it was about 58% from the dairy sector. In terms of level of education, 41%, which was the majority, you know, uh, uh, some came from one or two years certification in agriculture, and there were some less and some more. 51% um, of them had 21 to 30 year experience. 73% um, were full-time and um, 60%, this was their main job. They didn't do another one. The 40% had other jobs. And most of them were medium or large farms. So um, what did we find? So we wanted to um, find out about knowledge. So we, had, we kind of knowledge is two things. One is the objective knowledge. You know, you know something is right or wrong. And we also wanted to know subjective knowledge, how they felt they knowledgeable they were. So we made we measured knowledge in two different ways. Objective knowledge, we, are, we gave them seven questions. To the best of your knowledge, do you think these statements are true or false? And then, for example, questions like antibiotic skill bacteria. Okay, there were seven items like that. We also then asked them, how sure are you that this answer you gave is correct? So, you know, because we didn't want to just go by yes, no, by taking a 50-50% chance. Um, so we wanted to ask about how confident they were about their answer. Then putting that together, we came up with a scale of 0 to 35. And the mean objective knowledge for our sample was 25, 26, so 25.59. So, you know, they were highly, you know, in terms of objective knowledge, we would say the sample, you know, was quite high in objective knowledge. Next is subjective knowledge. We asked them compared to the average farmer, you know, I know a lot about antibiotics and so on. We had four of those. Total four to 20 was the range and um, the mean value was 15.83. So again, it was reasonably high on the scale that we measured. We also then asked them about awareness um, and 83 87% declared they were aware of the consequences of AMR and 70% declared they were aware of the concept of One Health. We ask about intention. So this is six statements and they had to pick which one applied to them, okay? So one was, I successfully made changes on how I use antibiotics. I have started to make changes. I have no intention. I intend to make changes. I know I should change, but I'm not ready to make. I tried to make change and um, I use antibiotics, but the changes didn't stick. So there were those various options and then they had to pick. And you found 33% that they had successfully made changes. Um, equal number felt that they had started to make change. So that's about 60 odd percent believe that they are, uh, they are starting to make change or they um, have made changes. And the rest, the third, about 20% said they had no intention to make change and the others were in between. We also then asked questions about what services do you use from your vet farm advisor, okay? And then when we collected that, we found that 96% um, you know, prescribe, use their um, vets for medication treating animals, 78% to get advice on herd health, 73% for laboratory testing, 63% for uh, herd health plans, and 60% for vaccination programs. We then asked about um, what, what, what would help you make the changes on the farm. And these are some of the things that um, were positive and one of the things that was, they weren't too positive about. So remember a scale of one to five, one was uh, not at all helpful, five very helpful. Subsidizing vaccination program scored four. So they you know it was a high support for that as well as financial uh, bonuses from the processor for taking action to reduce antimicrobial use. 
But when it came to introducing new policies and regulations, it was sort of, I mean, it's a, you know, 2.7, so more towards the not, not helpful, um, but not as negative as not at all helpful. So it was kind of lower than the other two, but it was um, low, you know, that's what they wanted. So then we identified, um, I think it was like 14 different practices. So we know you can ask people, have you made changes? Do you want to make changes? But what changes? What do we mean by changes? So we gave them um, some lists of things which are the changes that we wanted them to, which we considered to be good changes. And then we wanted to see how they responded. So the thing was, I use um, um, AB before consulting a vet getting AB um, directly from the vet, I share with other farmers, give AB prevent, um, prevent spread of disease, giving AB um, prevents disease. So, you know, what do they do and what do they believe? That's the kind of thing we did. If you look at, if it's mainly green, that means they agreed, okay? They do it always. If it's blue, that means they do never. Now, some, you know, those star ones are opposite. So it's not always saying yes for high, because we, you know, so some of them are negatively, rated. So I share AB with other farmers, which is the third one down, if you like. It's mainly blue, which is a good thing because that means never. Okay, so you have something like 70 odd people saying that I don't do that behavior. So doesn't green doesn't always always doesn't always mean positive. Sometimes never is positive. But this gives us a picture of what practices they see as good practice and what they say that they are doing. We then wanted to find out can, what predicts it? You know, if people are doing these things, what predicts it? So we made a, um, um, a collective of those 14, came up with a sum, and that is considered the um, responsible antimicrobial behavior, if you like. If some of them, you have to reverse code them to make sure it all goes in the right direction. And then we wanted to see, using our model, combi model, what predicts. And we found oh, less than 20% of the behavior, you know, the, chain, the variation in the behavior could be explained, which means there's 80% which we couldn't explain by this. But we found that um, socio-demographic differences, you know, like, sorry, social demographic differences explain 5% the variance, capability 3%, motivation 8%, but opportunity didn't explain. So what does that mean? So what I'm going to do is, if, for example, if you're looking at socio um, demographic, there were different items in there, and we then looked to see which was the item that, you know, helped to explain um, this variance, if you like. So, in relation to socio-demographic, how many years they've been working is the well, is one of the good predictors, okay? So, the more experience people had, that was correlated with more responsible behavior. We also found that farmers with less experience depended on peer support and social support uh, than farmers with more experience. And this seems to suggest that experience is an important factor in um, doing responsible use of antimicrobial resistance, in uh, using of anti antibiotics. The second thing that we found in terms of capability, under capability, subjective knowledge was um, a predictor. So those people who felt that they knew uh, about it were more responsible. Although objective knowledge wasn't a separate predictor, it was, high, it was correlated with objective knowledge. So if you increase people's objective knowledge through education, through various things, maybe it you know, has a um, knock-on effect on their subjective knowledge. And when they feel that they know, that's when they, that sort of um, has an impact on their behavior. So facilitating continuous education, online training, all those things are useful way of um, influencing the farmer to um, adhere to responsible use and behavior. Um, then under motivation, emotions, what we consider to be emotions, were an important factor. So if the question is something like, if you had to stop blanket use of antibiotics, how would it make you feel? And the question is unsatisfied, satisfied, the results were all, um, wise, um, foolish, wise, calm, um, agitated, you know, th that kind of scales. And we found those people who said they were satisfied, it was a wise thing to do, and they felt calm, were um, more positive about um, the, um, prudent use. Also, the emotions were highly correlated with their self-efficacy. So they, if they felt uh, these positive emotions, they also felt that they knew how to do it, you know, they're efficacious. So that is also a motivation. So although it didn't, was a separate motivator, they were correlated. So empowering farmers 
to make them feel good, but to make sure that they understand, um, you know, they, they feel happy about what they're doing has a positive effect. So that covers the um, farmers, what we found. And I'm going to do very quickly, because I've spent seven minutes now on the veterinarians. So this is a qualitative interview, small sample, but much more in-depth and really thematic analysis. And we are kind of given in terms of barriers and facilitators. So we identified certain things, barriers, and certain things as facilitators, but there were things that were both barrier and facilitator. And it sort of mirrored our uh, finding from our literature review. So you know, I can go a bit faster on this. Um, so in terms of animal welfare, identified a range of benefits and risks. Um, they, you know, they said that if you could improve farm management, then that will, you know, th then that means there will be a reduction in antimicrobial use. But they did not want to harm the animal. They were very much about making sure that the animal did not suffer, and that was, you know, and and um, you know, disease prevention was important to them. Um, Let's acknowledge that farmers' attitude towards the stu um, stewardship uh, strategies were important before implementing strategies to reduce um, antimicrobials. Uh, vets believe that if a farmer was not invested in making the change, then it was hard for them to get the change happen. Client pressure they talked about, okay, was a barrier. If the client wanted something, then they feel that they were obliged to do that. Otherwise, they felt they might lose the client or the client might go to somebody else um, and get the antibiotics anyway. Um, peer influence, I think this, I also talked about it before. Young vets sometimes felt that they couldn't um, influence the older ones. The older, you know, older vets had wanted to do it the way that there's always been done. But sometimes, in some practices, that wasn't the case. The young vets felt that they, you know, their way of treatment, what their suggestion were taken seriously and you know, were given prominence and was followed because they have been learning recently and that was seen as a positive thing. So peer influence um, was a you know, barrier as well as a facilitator. Communication was considered key. Communication with farmers, farmers and vets communication. Also, how vets felt how they communicated with each other was, um, 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 was positive and um, having some sort of training towards how to communicate was seen as something that was uh, positive to take forward. They also thought in terms of intervention, it had to be tailored and it had to be gradual, that doing a big jump you know, did not always produce the outcomes that you wanted. So tailored uh, approach that was a gradual approach, implemented and tested and monitored would be the way forward. They also felt that assigning one vet to one farm would also be beneficial because that way the, uh, the farmers couldn't to, you know, if you didn't do what they wanted them, you, what they would have liked you to do, that they couldn't hop and get somebody else, you know, that they had responsibility. But there's also longitudinal, you know, a relationship that you could build up with the farmer and that would help. Finally, education for themselves as well as for the farmer was considered something that was positive. So, in conclusion, farmers and vets from our study were interested in reducing antimicrobials. They wanted careful consideration and an evidence-based approach to um, have tailored and um, gradual interventions, if you like, and strategies so that you can monitor what is happening and take the positive behaviors forward. Um, I'd like to thank my um, fellow investigators, um, um, Claire McKernan, who was um, my postdoc, who gave me the slides as well as that did all the work, um, and Anya Regan, who was the PI on the project um, Works at Chagas, funded by Safe Food. Thank you. Good, Dean. Um, that was a fascinating study, um, highlighting such a range of factors influencing behaviour, both of farmers and vets. Um, so, quite a challenge for emerging policies and, and approaches to, to incorporate all those. Um, we've had a few questions come in, if you wouldn't mind. Um, first of all, are consumers aware of antimicrobial usage on farms and, and, and is it, is it um, important? So in this study, we didn't look at um, 
consumers, although you know, in, in terms of stakeholders, they are also a stakeholder. But we have done some work with um, pig farmers and, um, and the pig chain, and there we also looked at um, consumer behavior and consumer preferences and consumer choice and consumer knowledge and so on. And we found that, um, well, I am a consumer too, so the, our aware, so I'm going to say our rather than them. Um, our awareness of how the food is produced is minimal. We don't really know what goes on on the farm and when it ends up on our plate. And so when you talk about antimicrobial use, antimicrobial resistance, we only hear about it when it comes a scare story that goes on you know, in the media. And then you kind of see that as a negative thing. It's not a balanced opinion. So then if you go to the shop and you find something that says, um, antibiotic free and you think oh that must be good that must be better than something that doesn't say antibiotic free okay so we did we did do some testing and people had preferences for antibiotic free they were willing to pay but they were not aware that animals you know you use antibiotics for has been used in the past for multiple reasons but one of the reasons is for animal welfare and so no to answer your question Consumers are not aware because I don't think we do know. And I think part of the issue is sometimes when we see multiple products on the shelf, we are making wrong decisions because of our ignorance. And so I think it will be good in some ways to communicate to the consumer some of the processes that happen and why antibi you know, uh, antibiotics is used and the responsible use of antibiotics and how industry has implemented that, especially in Europe and all the changes that are you know, um, happening. So it will be good to know, it is good to communicate. And we did do some communication via like a QR code where consumers can go and find out more information about responsible use and so on. And so, you know, and that is a possibility, a way of communicate with the consumer to show them that, you know, uh, that antibiotic free is not necessarily a good thing. Responsible use might be better, but also within the EU, within the EU and within the current system, what you are eating, you don't have antibiotics or reduced it you know, because of all the processes that have been put in place, and it is safe. Um, I suppose leading on from that, what future research would be useful in this area? Um, so I think one of the things that we found from here is, is um, as I said, your communication is a big thing. So it's the communication farmer to vet as well as um, farmers within themselves. So I think um, um, funded by Chagas, we are working on a program where uh, vets are go, you know, we're doing like a tiny project where we are trying to train the vets on better communication because both Anya and I could come from the psychology background. And they, we have things like motivational interviewing, you know, different things that have been used in the health sector with positive outcomes, you know, how to change, how to influence the client, if you like, in terms of drug abuse and so on. But I'm not saying it's the same thing, but we could learn lessons from that. And we are trying to maybe um, put together a program to train some vets and farm advisors in terms of communicating with the farmer so that they could be um, of help to the farmer on a one-to-one -one basis to make these changes that are necessary on the farm level. Um, that's interesting because I think well, there's another question that's come in just around the role of the farm advisor. Um, but just this next question is around how do we learn from your lessons and bring social science into looking at how farmers would better manage um, land to protect the environment? Um, so farm advice from from the limited amount of information that we have got about farm advisors, we have found that farm advisors are on an individual basis implementing a lot of good practice. They are, you know, they're coming up with their own systems and so on. So one of the things that we are going to do at the beginning is um, rather than reinvent the wheel, um, as we're thinking about more like a co-design where we are actually going to talk to farm advisors to see what is their experience, what programs are they using, what are they, how are they communicating with the farmers. They may not know the social science language or you know what motivations and what behavior change techniques they are using, but they are using techniques. So what we are what we are planning to do is to collect all that information that the farm advisors have 
come up with, uh, you know, learn from what they have done, come up, you know, put them into a, like a model, come up with some extra ideas and practice those things. So I think there are some good practice out there, but they are ad hoc. So one of the things is to collect all those things and then come up with the program and using some um, organizations to promote those kind of practices to say this has been happening in these farms, but what about, you know, um, 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 these advisors? And um, it's, it's like, you know, like um, I, I know the social media, you know, influencers are the big thing. We have our own influences. There are farm, farms that are influencer farms. You know, they are the leaders. And there are um, advisors, um, farm advisors, who are influencers, but they are the leaders. But they don't go on the social media and say, you know, I'm doing this. But we could use them as um, examples, as good examples, as peer leaders to lead the other farmers and the advisors and vets so that it's basically... Um, um, train the trainer type thing. So we train a few people of how to do it, but they already have the knowledge and they could then maybe become the influencers of the future. Well, that's really interesting because, again, that's, that's really looking at accentuating the positive too. So, oh, do we have time for one more? Um, you're not off the hook yet. Um, um, what one change could policy makers make that would have the biggest positive impact on AMR? Okay, I'm, I'm sort of <laughs> I'm more from the consumer and the worker end rather than the policy end. I mean, I, I think we can come up with lots of policy. You know, I, I have, you know, and um, regulations policy is the one thing change. For example, I, I, I always say about seat belt. You know, you could say it changes. You know, where you see your, where your seat belt, nothing happened. But you know, there was a regulation came. You had to. But if you didn't have seat belts, you couldn't do it, right? So you have to think, okay, what happens to the cars that didn't have seat belts? You know, are they going to come up with a program where you can go and implement? So it's the same with any policy that you come up. You have to think, is it, you know, is, can people do it? Is it possible to do it? If they don't, don't have the opportunity to do it, you know, how can we set up processes that will help them to do it, that's one. And the second thing is, just because you know something does not mean that you can do it. So for example, I mean, this I always tell my students, we know that depending on which year the wine was made or which chateau it came from, it's a good wine. But unless you are a wine drinker and you've done a lot of wine tasting, you still can't go to the shop and buy the wine on the chateau or on the year, right? It's the experience that makes you into somebody who can make the choice. The same in the farm, right? You can bombard farmers with lots of information but unless you, they have the confidence to implement it, they need to, you know, so therefore maybe having, um, they can see another farm that does it, they can do some farm with it, they can maybe go and help in a farm where they have some practical experience. Those kind of steps we need to put in if you want to make genuine change, because the risk for the farmer is high. You know, he can do something, but if it fails, that's his livelihood gone. So it's a big risk. So you need to find ways of minimizing that risk by you know, making sure he understands or he, she understands, but also has some hands-on experience to know that the, you know, it can be implemented. So that's from a non-farming person talking. I think we can all take that advice and apply it across all of our work, but thank you very much, Professor. Thank you. Uh, now we have um, our next speaker from AFBE. Dr. Simone Angeloni, a senior research economist. Simone is a behavioral economist and his most recent research interests are on sustainability, farmers' education, and farm safety. Um, Angel um, Simone will be talking to us about his work on the effects of risk and uncertainty on farmers' adoption of voluntary measures to promote conservation and restoration of water bodies in Northern Ireland. Over to you, Simone. Does it show any? Okay. Okay, so in this presentation, um, I'm going to talk about the effect of environmental uncertainty on farmers' adoption of sustainable practices, especially uh, if linked to water quality here in Northern Ireland. In terms of general background, uh, um, in, in general, intervention to improve water quality are usually described as a situation where individuals are uh, collectively better off by adjusting farming practices 
However, self-interest, lack of knowledge, etc., uh, push them uh, to continue with business as usual. In other words, there is lack of cooperation. Within this debate, uh, there is a quite substantial body of research that indicates that uncertainty about the effort to improve water quality further reduce cooperation. So here, uh, I need to be clear about uncertainty. Um, uh, basically, um, the problem is that we don't know exactly the level of uh, environmental effort that is required to achieve an environmental outcome. Uh, most of this is due to the fact that farming is interacting with the environment a lot. Uh, environment is a pretty complex thing. Um, just to make an example, there are biodiversity indicators that sometimes they go in the opposite direction because it depends on the uh, flora and fauna species and things are in competition. There are predators and prey. Uh, so the problem is that this uncertainty on people, on farmers, consumers, even countries, uh, reduce the level of environmental uh, cooperation. In this research, I'm going to apply, um, to run um, an experiment uh, applied to the um, environmental farming scheme wider option. I don't know if you are familiar uh, about this option, but basically it's uh, quite articulated, but the main point, it requires farmers to create buffer zones uh, along river courses and uh, water bodies. Um, basically to reduce the interaction between livestock activity uh, such that the quality of water uh, deteriorates. So in terms of uh, what type of experiment was done, uh, we did what is called a conceptualized field experiment. A conceptualized field experiment uh, is like a, a table game, like a monopoly, where participants face the same rule. Uh, they have to make choices, and at the end, they are paid according to their choices. So just to make an example, we asked them to run a dairy farm. We specified the size of the of the dairy farm, we specified the stocking density, we also specified the slope of, of the soil, etc., etc. And we asked them to make a series of choices in terms of adoption of the environmental farming scheme. Uh, with respect to monopoly, where you have dices to proceed with the game, we use spinning wheels, uh, mostly to show farmers the fact that there is some uncertainty linked to the environment, and because at the end of the game, they still need to be paid. So. Uh, then we introduce a little bit of uh, um, cooperation and we show them picture, we told them, okay, look, your farm, your farm is located along the uh, river catchment together with other nine farms identical like you. And we um, internalize the environmental cost. We told them that basically the quality of water in the river catchment was so deteriorated that if an action wasn't taken, there was the risk of an irrecoverable deterioration of water quality. And if this would happen, there would be an economic loss uh, for, for each participant, for each uh, farmers, uh, via a series of compulsory measures. And again, we provide examples in terms of uh, uh, compulsory removal of some land from farming, uh, reduction of stocking rate, uh, investment in slurry tanks, etc. Uh, farmers could avoid this scenario if they cooperate via the um, environmental farming scheme. And basically, if they create this buffer zone along the river course, and this could be done as uh, the, the, the actual scheme under two options. Uh, one is called less sustainable farming practice. It requires to create uh, narrow stripes, uh, stripes, sorry, narrow buffer zone and it's cheaper for farmers in terms of organic income. Another is more expensive and it requires to create a wider um, buffer zone. Um, the payoff that we used to uh, calculate these two options was based on the current level employed by DERA uh, to pay farmers. I, I would like also uh, to say one aspect. These two options in the game work like poker chips. So they could use one on another and one was more expensive than the other. The problem is that the game was made such that uh, they couldn't avoid the environmental deterioration only using the cheapest one. They have to spend some money even in the most expensive one. So uh, we say farmers, okay, you have a, a fictional saving account with 7,000 pounds. You will make a series of choices. We calculate your payoff and you will be paid at the end uh, according to the balance in this uh, saving account with the condition that 1,000 pounds is one pound in real life. We actually pay them. 
we shown video. Uh, we spinning wheels to uh, get them familiarized with the concept of uncertainty under different settings. So we asked them to take a practice round to see if they understood how the payoff uh, were calculated. And then they were ready for the game. So uh, to summarize, the game has two strategies as it should be in, in real life. One is cooperation. That means they submit some land to reduce the probability of an environmental deterioration. And clearly they pay a cost, but they have this benefit. Maybe the economic loss is avoid, or they, they were free to not cooperate, not pay any cost, but there is the risk of an environmental deterioration. The game was designed such that cooperation was always better than non-cooperation for farmers in terms of take home money. Finally, uh, we asked farmers to face the same choice how much land do you want to submit uh, to the environmental farming scheme under four different uh, uncertainty, certainty situations. We basically divide farmers in two groups. In group one, uh, we kept fixed the, the economic uncertainty, the uncertainty due to the economic loss if uh, an environmental deterioration happens. And we gradually reduce, ask them to face the same question uh, in front of uh, um, a setting that gradually reduce the level of environmental uncertainty. In group two, we did the opposite. We kept fixed the environmental uncertainty and we gradually reduce the level of economic uncertainty linked to their economic loss. So here uh, we see the results for group one. So we are keeping fixed the economic loss, we, we told them, okay, look, if there is an environmental disaster, you are going to lose 3,500 pounds, something like that. And we gradually decrease the level of environmental uncertainty. And as you can see, the level of submitted land increases uh, the more we move close to the uh, certainty level. In other words, farmers' uh, environmental uncertainty and risk uh, reduce the amount of submitted land. This is, these are the results for group two. In this case, we kept fixed uh, the environmental uncertainty, and we gradually reduced in a series of different questions sorry, the amount of uh, uh, certainty linked to the economic loss. And again, you see that the amount of land is in, submitted land is increasing the more we move close to the uh, certainty, even if in this case there aren't a lot of difference between partial risk and certainty. Uh, in terms of specific details, uh, as I was mentioned, farmers have these two poker chips, one, uh, two options, one less sustainable farming practice, one more sustainable farming practice. Uh, they would love to use the less sustainable farming because it's cheaper for them, but they couldn't avoid uh, uh, the cooperation and so the environmental deterioration only with the cheapest one. As you can see, uh, the green charts on the left, there is basically not effect uh, on the, 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 the less sustainable farming products or the cheapest one, and all the effect is on the more sustainable farming products. Here I'm making a comparison between uh, these two groups. So between uh, farmers that were subject to the environmental uncertainty and farmers that were subject only to the economic uncertainty. The game was designed like there was an optimal level of land that could be submitted, a, a, an amount of land that maximized the take home money. What is interesting is that under every situation, under every level of uh, uncertainty, farmers from the economic uh, uncertainty group submitted a larger proportion of farmers, submitted more land than farmers uh, from the uh, group uh, with the environmental uncertainty. And actually, if you also see uh, how far they go from the optimum, farmers from group two subject to the economic uncertainty are, are also closer to the optimal level. So they optimize their money somehow. They show more con a more consistent behavior. In terms of uh, uh, overall results, uh, unfortunately, only between 36-53% of farmers uh, submitted uh, land to avoid an environmental uh, deterioration of water quality. They didn't miss it by a lot. Uh, on average, they missed between 10 and 20%. But what is uh, interesting here is that they never achieve or exceed, because they could exceed the optimal level of cooperation. In other words, uh, um, 
it somehow they didn't maximize the, the possibility to take home money that was designed in the game. They didn't co uh, cooperate enough. So in terms of policy implication, uh, results indicated that policymakers should understand how farmers respond to uncertainty, environmental uncertainty, because this reduces their um, environmental commitment to improve water quality. This happens uh, for the, if uncertainty is linked to the economic loss or is linked to the environment per se. And also, uh, even if there are differences and farmers seems to be particularly um, adverse with respect to the environmental uncertainty. Uh, another story is that this seems to affect mostly uh, those sustainable farming products that usually are more expensive for farmers. That we may also say usually are also the most effective or in many cases can be the most effective. Cooperation amongst farmers can fail even in presence of group bonuses. Uh, I didn't mention one thing, but for in defense of farmers, this type of results is actually quite common even if we work outside farmers with consumers in terms of recycling, et cetera. Um, there are some studies that show that in some contexts cooperation works uh, is when uh, participants can state their level of commitment is not binding, but in a series of repeated rounds, people sooner or later, a group of people start to converge to the social optimum. So we couldn't do this because of the pandemic. Two people, we, we ran this online, so everybody took the, the survey when it was best for them. There wasn't this... Uh, uh, communication between farmers. Uh, we also observe quite uh, differentiated responses. Uh, several farmers submit a small amount of land. A few of them submit a quite large amount of land that may indicate that farmers have different attitudes towards sustainability and so theoretically conservation auction or even uh, tradable use rights in terms of water quality may be effective. Thank you, Dr. Anzalone. That was um, some fascinating findings um, and it's generated some questions here. Um, first of all, why do you think farmers were not able to achieve or exceed the optimal level of commitment? So, uh, thank you. Uh, basically, uh, I mean, it's a quite sad news uh, because they didn't make the best choice for themselves, okay, in, in the game. Uh, this is, uh, they may have some expectation. People also, when we talk about environment, they may really love status quo, they don't like changing, etc. In this specific example also, uh, they may have underestimate in a subjective manner the probability of an, an, a negative environmental outcome, even if we told them how much it was. But in general, uh, I would like to stress the importance of communication between with farmers and among farmers, because it, it may actually improve. You, 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 we may see that people achieve or exceed the optimal level. So it, it could be effective. I'm thinking about, for instance, uh, business discussion groups, environmental, etc. Um, and another question here is, um, what could um, what could the possible reasons be for the lower levels of commitment by farmers under environmental uncertainty? Okay, uh, so um, basically uh, the, the, the explanation I think is is really simple. People are used to financial uncertainty every day, and I would say farmers more than everybody else because of the weather, because of the there was the common market, but it, let's say international competition. Uh, Etc. Cetera, Etc. Cetera. Uh, environmental uh, environment is a complex theme, and, and from my understanding, sometimes it works also like uh, like the pandemic. There is a, a load of emotions in this topic, and people sometimes don't make the best decision. Like there is evidence that similar results come out when uh, we make decision for it. Uh, people they know what is the best choice, they still don't do the best for them. Eh? because they get anxious, something they can't process all the information. Um, that's really interesting because again, that's very important for us um, and our various pieces of work to make sure that our messages are well presented and that we're communicating those complex environmental issues properly. But I think, is that us for questions? Okay, thank you very much, you. Dr. Okay, um, our final speaker um, of today's event um, is Dr. Catherine Glass. 
um, who is uh, works for for AFB as well. Um, Catherine is senior research economist um, and will be talking to us about delivering connective nature-based solutions, barriers faced by farmers and potential solutions. Catherine is, um, has 12 years experience in economic research, including non-market valuation, behavioral economics and opinion dynamics. Um, current projects include monetizing the benefits of catchment management, examining how behavioural economics can be applied to enhance agri-environment schemes. Her research and opinion dynamics used simulation modelling to represent interpersonal interactions in social networks. Um, over to you, Dr. Glass. So the, the talk I want to give today is, is basically giving some highlights from the ALICE project on delivering connective nature-based solutions barriers faced by farmers and potential solutions. So the ALICE project is an inter funded project with partners in Northern Ireland, Ireland, France, Spain and Portugal. And the goal of the project is to promote sustainable investments in connective nature-based solutions. So the role of AFB is to identify the factors which might enhance or constrain the implementation of connective nature-based solutions and also to conduct field work in the Carlingford catchment to identify barriers that farmers might face. So nature-based solutions are actions to protect, sustainably manage and restore natural and modified ecosystems that address societal challenges effectively and adaptably, um, sustain, um, simultaneously providing human well-being and biodiversity benefits. So these challenges could be water quality threats, rising carbon emissions leading to global warming, biodiversity loss, increased flood risk or, or wildfires. So nature-based solutions also, um, they're, they're also called um, blue-green infrastructures and they have a role to play in tackling these, these issues. Now nature-based solutions could be measures like um, planting trees, hedgerows, wildflower strips, riparian zones, peatland restoration, timber dams, and even ladybirds and bats have a role to play because they can be deployed on zero pesticide farms for pest control. So just to take an example of this, if you think of the, of the challenge of flooding, um, I suppose typically in the past, you know, there would have been a very strong emphasis on, on grey infrastructures, such as um, concrete dams and, and barriers and, and storage tanks, that sort of thing. Whereas nature-based solutions would take a different approach. It would be about planting trees and hedgerows, about um, cover cropping to increase the absorption of water and to slow surface runoff. It could be creating ponds and wetland areas as storage areas and uh, putting in you know, leaky dams to slow the flow. And, and these measures are also beneficial to water quality because it results in less pesticide and soils getting into um, waterways and also biodiversity by virtue of the, the hedgerows and the, and the tree planting wetland creation, not to mention recreational benefits and, and carbon benefits. So I think the beauty of nature-based solutions is, is that they can deliver multiple benefits simultaneously. So in contrast to, to grey infrastructures, which really just provide um, a single benefit. I'm just moving on from that to connective nature-based solutions. Now, these are also called blue-green infrastructure networks or BGINs. These are strategically planned networks of, of nature-based solutions rather than kind of piecemeal, isolated interventions. And the aim of connective nature-based solutions is just to make sure that there's a connectivity um, so that um, everything is strategically placed within the landscape. Things are done at landscape level so that habitats and, and ecosystems and, and practices are done at that sort of um, um, strategic sort of scale, landscape scale, to ensure that, um, that um, implementation is addressed um, at a local level by, by, through a collaboration of, of local stakeholders. But this requires um, the cooperation of multiple stakeholders to, um, for, for, for it to succeed. And a very good example of this is the Edelston Water Project. Um, you can see the picture there. Basically, back in 2009, the, the water was rated bad um, under the Water Framework Directive for ecological status. The river had been severely straightened 
um, and along with other land use changes, there was severe um, habitat loss and also flood risk for 582 houses um, in the area. But basically, the, the Edelston Water Project, you can see in the picture, they actually um, re-meander 2.2 um, kilometres of, of the river, creating an extra 300 metres in length. Um, just, and, and this slowed the flow quite a bit and also increased the, the habitat in the area in terms of, of quantity and quality and diversity of, of, of the habitats. Um, they also planted 200,000 trees and 22 plon ponds were created and over 100 engineered um, log structures were put into place. And, and what was important about all of this was that they really had to go for a very strategic um, approach and, and these measures had to be placed in, in strategic locations around the catchment to, to an or in order to create a network that would meet the programme goals. And it was a very successful um, project. Um, so it's a, just a very good example of connective nature-based solutions. In terms of the, of the work done in Alice, the focus was on the Carlingford catchment. Excuse me. <clears throat> the catchment covers 470 kilometres, and the majority of it is, is in Northern Ireland. The land use is dominated by, by livestock agriculture. And there's also some sheep grazing in the mountainous areas as well, and some extensive... Um, agriculture. Um, there are over a thousand farms in the area with an average size of about 28.5 hectares, which is a little bit um, smaller than the Northern Ireland average of 41. There are several designated areas in the catchment too, um, areas of, of outstanding natural beauty, um, special areas of conservation and of special scientific interest. So as part of Alice stakeholder workshops were, um, were carried out to identify key environmental issues in the area. And these included um, water quality and flood risk and welfare risk. And these were issues that could be seen to benefit from blue green infrastructures. <clears throat> now, as part of the project as well, as well as um, having the stakeholder workshops, there were a small number of interviews carried out with farmers in the catchment and also with intermediary bodies. And um, so we looked at, you know, the barriers that farmers would face to, to um, nature-based solutions. Um, and just in terms of those, those barriers, I suppose, it, it would categorise them under risk perceptions and also informational barriers and, and administrative burdens. One of the key things that came out was that farmers, naturally enough, are very, very focused on production. And they found it difficult to take seriously the contribution that, um, that the adoption of nature-based solutions would, would make to their, to their farm business. Um, but they were willing to consider um, adopting these measures on, on less productive land or land that's inaccessible to, to machinery. Some of the farmers were quite frustrated with capping in the current scheme because they had planned to carry out um, extra environmental work and that was no longer going to be feasible. Um, time commitments as well came up. One of the issues in, in the catchment is, is this shift towards um, part-time working amongst a lot of the farmers. So they're keen to just keep their businesses alive. And so they're keen to simplify operations as much as possible. So some of them felt that maybe uh, the, the, the time commitment involved would just be too much just in terms of maintaining measures. Um, constraints on, on, on um, land use, that was certainly an issue with one farmer who felt that you can create something today and in a few years time it will be used against you in terms of the constraints it would place upon you. There were informational barriers as well. Um, there was more advice um, needed. Um, one farmer was talking about how he couldn't um, locate information on the wildflower seeds he had to use, and he was worried about this because it was a results-based scheme. Other farmers were interested in more information on ongoing management and just getting out into the field, you know, doing field visits and getting out and seeing what, what else is being done out there. There was also um, just this... Um, satisfaction, I suppose, with the amount of paperwork. Um, one of the farmers just, uh, described it as soul destroying, that it was just so much paperwork that it put some of them off. One of them was going to engage in the organic scheme, but we just felt that there was just too much red tape. Um, just in terms of barriers to connective nature-based solutions, the, the stakeholder workshops identified that the environmental management was, was complex in, in Carlingford. Um, there were different layers of administration from international to national to, to local um, council level on both sides of the border. So there was a, a lack of integrated management 
um, which, which, which was kind of producing fragmented outcomes. So what was needed, I suppose, was some sort of unifying institution to bring everything together that just wasn't there. There's also the large number of small farms, which would create a, a challenge for coordination, as well as the self-sufficiency and independence of, of farmers that would, could make um, group work a little bit more challenging. On a positive note, the farmers who had um, implemented measures were very positive about them. They were very enthusiastic and really wanted to, to showcase them. And there's also an awful, an awful lot of interesting work being done in the catchment as well by groups like the Woodland Trust, the Mourn Heritage Trust and RSPB. Just in terms of potential solutions, I just want to look at three very briefly. The first is um, invest in a trusted intermediary. Uh, the second is to invest in bespoke farmer plans. And the third is to invest in um, social capital building. So the first one, in our case study review, we found that a common thread for successful Beijing adoption was the place of a trusted intermediary, somebody who can come between the farmers and, and the funding body. Um, they, they have a very wide remit, which means that they're in a very good position to address a lot of the barriers that the farmers face. For example, recruitment of land owners, program delivery and design, and um, program nego um, payment negotiation, conflict resolution, helping with paperwork, um, community outreach to raise the profile of the work being done. So a very wide remit. Um, a few very good examples of this uh, um, was the Tweed Forum, who were involved with the um, Edelston project, and just brilliant for bringing farmers on board, building up trust, removing removing barriers, making sure that farmers felt that. Um, what they were going to do was it was going to be a win-win situation for them, helping with up, upfront finance. So just breaking down all these barriers. And they were a well-established um, organisation in the area, so we're in a good position to do that. Agrivert in France, they, um, they were very successful over, over a long period, a 10-year period of transforming conflict um, into um, cooperation in order to protect water um, quality in the Vittel region in France. Ballandary Rivers Trust as well, um, great relationships with the farmers, great at getting them on board in order to improve water quality and they succeeded in, in um, reversing declining um, um, pearl mussel levels um, in the Ballandary River. But what's, what's important about these um, groups is that it takes time to build up trust. It, 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 it most certainly does. It, it, building up trust, getting farmers used to the idea being there, building up trust in the community, being known as their organizations who are on the farmer's side. Um, secondly, just briefly, um, investing in bespoke far, um, plans for farmers. Farmers are willing to consider um, adopting um, nature-based solutions on marginal lands, um, but, but they may be willing to do more, as we found, if, if the possibilities are presented to them. And um, this is the Bride Project in Cork, and basically what they're trying to do is increase, increase biodiversity on an intensive um, farmland. And as part of the, the farm to fork um, strategy, they're aiming at 10% really of, um, of um, agricultural land to be devoted to conservation. This project was, was done at landscape level, getting groups of farmers together, very community-based, to develop biodiversity goals. But as well as that, bespoke plans were built and were, were drawn up for each, for each farmer, just to show um, what was possible. You can see there, I think it's a fantastic uh, picture of um, Donald Sheens, the project manager of Bride, showing all the different things that can be done on this farm, producing a, a biodiversity a management um, figure of 11.76%, um, which, is, which is very good. Lots of other organizations like the Woodland Trust and Rivers Trust use consultants or trained project officers to get out there and to give um, farmers that individual support. As well as that, it just it builds trust with the farmers, builds confidence, and it reduces the burden of, uh, of decision making for them. Finally, I think investing in social capital building is really important as well. And this is created when relationships mean that there's a shared sense of identity. And the great thing about social capital is it drives collective action. And there's so many ways that this can be done through farmer networks and um, workshops for farmers, training, performance training opportunities, getting farmers in to discuss um, future schemes, um, building up stakeholder networks, supporting intermediaries, supporting a coordination between intermediaries to make sure there isn't overlapping. Also building up links with local businesses who might be keen to promote their eco-credentials through getting involved and maybe providing extra funding for this sort of work. Community networks, 
I mean, it's, it's great to, to, to basically feel that the coal community is behind you in terms of what you're doing on your farm. So, you know, teaching the, teaching the, the, the local community, you know, about the, the, the benefits of this sort of work, celebrating the achievements of farmers on, on social media or through awards and competitions. I think all of that is, is, is very important. It just builds, it builds a vision really um, of what can be done and just kind of sets the ball rolling. Um, just in conclusion, um, connective nature-based solutions have the potential to deliver multiple benefits. Barriers do exist, but there, are, but there are good solutions out there, such as using trusted intermediaries, investing in farmers in terms of bespoke plans and, and individual support, and in building relationships with the local community and between stakeholders. Um, please see our link for, for, far, for further information. Um, you'll see the, um, the booklet that we have as well um, on nature-friendly um, farming um, and a few success interviews. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you very much, Dr. Glass. That was um, fascinating, really, hearing how you're introducing that, the, the complex issue of nature-based solutions to farmers. And I think the value of having that project, the Alice Project, actually helping to demonstrate on the ground what you actually mean, making it more understandable. Um, there's a few questions here for you. Um, how important overall do you think the financial payment is in encouraging farmers to adopt nature-based solutions? Um, I, th I think the, the financial um, incentive is, is important, but to a, a greater or lesser extent, depending on the, on the, on the farmer. Um, I suppose in our scheme, I mean, some of the... Um, in our interview, some of the farmers were saying, we're really not in this for the money. Um, they, I suppose that they, they, they got a very small payment for what they were doing and they felt like they were covering their costs and they were satisfied with that. They were okay with that because they really felt that what they were doing was worthwhile. Now, of course, if these farmers were, were doing this farming on, on marginal land, you know, on less productive land or land where it was difficult to get the machinery in. Now, on the other hand, if you have farmers who, um, are in maybe strategic locations in this landscape sort of um, scheme of things, I, you know, and the land is productive, you know, of course they're going to need, you know, proper compensation. You know, they're going to need compensation that's similar to the amount of money that they would get if that land is in production. And they will need it guaranteed and they will need it to know that there are no big risks attached with it. It's going to be here one year and then gone the next. So I think that side of it's very important. Um, so it does depend on the farmer's situation, how productive the land is and the, and the cost to him. But, you know, in terms of the cost to him as well, there are other factors, I suppose, besides the financial ones that come into it. You know, a, a lot of farmers, you know, that they can't face the paperwork or there's cash flow issues with introducing measures. There's loads of other factors or psychological issues, you know, just putting it off and just maybe needing somebody to come alongside them to help with the burden of, of decision making. So I think there's a lot of non-financial factors that can come into play as well, which are quite significant. But in terms of the overall payment, it's, it's definitely important when they're giving up productive land. If land is not as productive, they, 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 they will not need as much. But, you know, they, they need a lot of encouragement. I mean, I think some of our farmers were quite, you know, they, 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 they were frustrated about being in the media for, for, for all the wrong reasons at times. And they wanted people to, you know, to see what they were doing and to appreciate the efforts that they were making. And I think when you have the community behind you, I think, you know, you don't need as much money if, if people appreciate what you're doing. I agree. Um, another question here is, you mentioned the, the toolkit there at the end, um, linked to the Carlinford project. Who is it for and what sort of information is in it? Yes, well, as part of the Alice project, we felt, I suppose, that information was extremely important and, and lacking. I suppose when maybe when farmers go on to look at agri-environment schemes, you know, the information tends to be fairly bland. And, you know, I suppose it's giving farmers something that's, you know, more inspirational. So, so the team drew up a, a booklet, you know, you'll, you'll see it just on that. Um, it's on the last, it was on the last slide there um, on nature and friendly farming. But, but basically it's, it provides lots of information, not just about, um, I suppose it, quite often farmers can be very, you know, look, looking just at the costs and maybe there's not as much attention given to the benefits. So basically it, it looks at the benefits for the farmers of introducing all of these measures and also looks at the benefits to the wider community. Um, as well as giving a whole um, load of information about um, different contact organizations and how much money that they would be expected to, to um, 
to get from introducing um, various measures. So, so lots of very useful information, and I think presented in a way that's attractive, you know, and, and, and inspirational too, as well as uh, that there were a few interviews done, um, success story interviews um, done by the Moran Heritage Trust and um, Ballanderry Rivers Trust, and as well as, you know, they had um, Chris Bay, um, from the from the Tweed Forum, you know, the Edelston Water Project to give an interview as well. So all of those interviews are there as well. So they're really, I suppose, they're really aimed at the farmers um, in, in the Carlingford catchment area because it's tailored to them. But on the other hand, um, it, it's there's a lot of useful information for other people, for, for policymakers or people interested in this whole topic there as well. So, uh, so yeah, please take a look at that, certainly. Good. Thank you very much, Dr. Glass. Um, Folks, that concludes session three um, of today's proceedings. Um, I, I would like to take this opportunity to thank um, Professor Dean, um, Dr. Angeloni and Dr. Glass for their really thought-provoking presentations, um, which have really set out a lot of the issues that we need to take forward and consider in taking um, and developing our sustainable agriculture and environmental restoration programs and policies, the roles of messaging, knowledge exchange, and getting the incentives and the bespoke interventions. Because again, these are all local issues, so we need to tailor them for, the, for our audience. But thank you very much for your, for your presentations. Um, I will now hand over to Dr. McGowan, who will give us some concluding remarks. Thank you very much, um, Sarah, and thank you to all attendees. I realise, you know, there's about 150 have stayed online most of the day, so well done. And if you're anything like me, your head is blown with all this information and data and results. But I think it's been a really powerful day and a really exciting day and, and one that's really challenged me as well personally, just, you know, being so rooted in the agri-food industry and actually, you know, understanding the economic aspects of it and even the future aspects that, that Bruce um, outlined. So this morning we very much started with, with Michael and Adwali and um, Alistair talking about productivity in terms of the relationship between productivity and environmental sustainability and I think in general there's positivity there that the two can very much work hand in hand but there are going to be challenges and as Alistair said you know stacking up between Brexit and climate change and all of these coming together there's a lot of work actually still needed there to flush out what that all means for um, local productivity global productivity etc etc so you know, that was our, our first session and, and thank you Michael very much for your your expert lecture within that session and for coming up from UCD this morning. The middle session then of today was very much Bruce Howard um, opening our minds to the whole world of private finance and the role it could potentially play in this whole agenda of farming going forward. And I think for me, it has really brought to light and cemented the fact that farming is going to be very different in the next 10 years, not only the way we farm, but actually the value that we can get from the land. It's not all going to be about cows in 10 years time. The land actually has much more value than just producing cows or sheep. And that whole private equity coming alongside government initiatives, I think is going to be an interesting space over the next 10 years and, and what that looks like going forward. So um, fantastic panel discussion then with Russell Smith from KPMG, Diane Ruddick from um, National Trust and Wesley Asson from the UFU. And I think if any of you missed that session, we'd really encourage you to, to watch it. Then in the afternoon, of course, we moved on to the whole area of behavioural change and delighted that Professor Moira Dean joined us um, and gave some of her work um, on, on farmer attitudes, especially in the space of AMR. And then Simone and Catherine, um, our own staff from AFB, following up with some of the really nice work that you're also doing in the space to understand farmers' behaviours and farmers' attitudes and actually what the key initiatives and what the drivers for change potentially are from a behavioural perspective. So all in all, a, a really full day of information um, and, and knowledge. Thanks to Norman and Sarah for, for chairing throughout the day. And at the start of the day, I did say I'd, I thanked Paul for bringing the conference to life. And I'm now going to congratulate Paul as the head of our economics research branch in AFP for putting together such a really good programme and the team in the economics um, branch for, for having really good presentations. So folks, um, hopefully it's not as windy and rainy where you are. It certainly, <laughs> Storm Barra hasn't completely left yet, I don't think. 
But um, wherever you are, hopefully you're comfortable and safe and well. And uh, I'm going to wish you a happy Christmas. And you can watch this back whenever you've maybe more time to digest it as well. It should be available on playback maybe within the next week or so. So all the best. Thanks for your time today and uh, safe travels wherever you head.